Hello Proponomics people and welcome to the Sunday Supplement from the 10th of March 2024. I've called this one Damp Squib Budget. As you'll know I like to start with a quote and this week's is Damp Squib Budget will be remembered as a Chancellor signing his party's death warrant. And that was the powerful words from Kevin Maguire, the Associate Editor at the Daily Mirror this week. So before we begin, Rod Turner and I ran a property business workshop in January in London. We covered a wide range of topics all the way from what a great investment looks like, to how to operate more than one company, why you would do that, how you might structure it, all the way down to a whole host of productivity hacks and general January fitness activities for your businesses. We enjoyed it, we got some great feedback, and we met some great people too. We're going to run another one with fresh content, including due diligence, both on business partners and with a view to lending money, joint ventures, mergers and acquisitions, and some accompanying case studies on some easy and more complex deals that we've done. The link for the tickets to the next one will be in the show notes, and the date for that is Wednesday the 24th of April, and there's a discount for the early birds that's ending during this week coming, so don't be shy. So, there was a bit of a ramp around the budget, near hysteria. The Telegraph nearly blew up in trying to get a stubborn Jeremy Hunt to cut all sorts of taxes. The last roll of the dice, I'm sure they felt, in getting Hunt to abolish or stamp out inheritance tax due to the proclivities of the likely incoming administration. In fact, I'd wager that the average UK house price will be above the inheritance tax threshold before the 325k is changed. Although, of course, if you own a house, you do get an extra 175k as a person, or 350k if you were ever part of a couple. So that's an unfair yardstick. That 325k number has been there since 2007, although the band associated with housing ownership was only phased in in the 1718 tax year. At least another parliament before there's another change there, and with wealth inequality growing, it will take a Liz Truss-led Tory resurgence, or its equivalent, surely not, surely never, please, to cut that tax rather than letting inflation work its magic. Politics these days leaks everything, so there are no leaks anymore. In fact, news would be, this policy wasn't leaked. That's the preferred route now. Understandable, I suppose. Minimises U-turns. Note, minimises, not eliminates. I'll get into the budget highlights. That won't take long. The property-related consequences and the summaries of the budget from two different schools of thought in due course this week. I'll also tuck into the Office for the Bloody Ridiculous, the OBR, and their forecasts, at least one of which is indisputably already in the toilet even though they've just revised it. Spoiler alert, they think house prices are going to go down 2% this year. Fools. But they were at minus 4.7%, so there we go. However, I'm first of all going to kick off properly with the macro scoreboard. And this week was somewhat devoid of macro events, which is exactly why the budget is timed in the week that it is. I can still choose my big four, however. Retail sales monitor, purchasing managers indices, the Halifax house price index, and, you know it, the five-year bond and swap yields. Retail sales have been anemic for years, a big boost in the throes of lockdowns, and then haircuts ever since that, as that glut of goods people bought has worked its way through eBay and similar thrift outlets. There has been an element of nominal growth, which inflation and particularly spiralling wage costs has fuelled. Growth in name only, shrinkage after inflation applied. A beleaguered sector, no doubt, which tends to see consolidation, merger and acquisition, and a few cash cow businesses fighting the good fight on an ongoing basis. It keeps my cash in beers anyway. The year on year is forward by a mighty 1%, so 3% down in real terms or thereabouts, and below the consensus forecasts. Another little indicator that consumption has really cooled, and the very largest component of GDP is looking wobbly. We may well not power out of this recession, but limp out at this rate. So the PMIs. My favourite indicator of them all for, for their timeliness and accuracy. Services for Feb was revised down to 53.8. The flash forecast a couple of weeks back was 54.3. And this was a surprise to the downside. But north of 53 is still very healthy indeed. Services look good. Construction was different. Up to 49.7, which was well above the market consensus of 49. But of course still marginally negative as it's 0.3 below that magical 50 mark. A tiny bit of shrinkage, but construction battles on. Let's see what the spring brings as headlines start to tell the tale of a rising market. On the subject of said rising market, Halifax weighed in with their best efforts to continue defeating their own predictions. 
February is their fifth up month in a row, in spite of their gloomy 2024 forecast of minus 4%. Only 0.4% up and only 1.7% up on the year. So, just like retail, down in real terms, but it does make you wonder if they even read their own data before they make predictions. These were a cooling on January's number. Now, January had a lot of relatively cheap money, relatively, not, com not truly cheap, before the yields hardened again, as you might remember. But we'd all rather that slow and steady win the race, I'm sure. Halifax currently just over 1.6% in front for 2024 alone. So 5.6% away from their forecast. They better hurry up with those down months, eh? They need to average a loss of half a percent a month from here on in for the rest of the year to meet their forecast. Best of luck with that, Halifax. That takes us to the bond yields. And we opened higher this week on the five year at 4.01 to close the week under the magic number again at 3.907. The product teams at the lenders must be celebrating these typical bond market weeks, which are, frankly, as dull as ditch water. The budget dropped yields by perhaps 10 basis points, and I'm not sure why. I'd see it as more inflationary, and we'll get into that in the analysis. But then, as everything had already been leaked, that may already have been priced in, of course. And the feeling was at hand that the hand is OK on the tiller, and the Bank of England will hold hard on rates as long as they need to. The swaps closed Thursday's market at 3.877 for the five-year Sonia. Still trading under, still indicating suppressed mortgage demand. The market still feels as though it will stall forward to me right now in the figures for March when they do come out. Although this is subject to change week on week if the volatility picks back up, of course. This sees the current no-fee rate at Paragon, 5.94%, look well-priced. If you can beat the total cost of debt on this mortgage and you have the luxury from a cash flow perspective of even considering a 5.94% mortgage at 75%, I know that many won't, then you should be laughing. That's as good as it gets right now. I saw better products this week in the low fives with 2% fees that fitted one particular remortgage that we were doing in a better way from a total cost of debt perspective. So that's the macro. On to the budget. The property specific elements first, as this is a long one, but not this part. Three changes of note specifically property specific. Firstly, the removal of multiple dwellings relief or MDR. I've seen all sorts of analysis about this since Wednesday and I'm afraid most of it is wrong. Remember, we don't always have the complete details on budget day, but on the current reading of it, A, transactions of between two and five properties that are linked. The definition is long, but in typical HMRC, HMRC style, it is catch all. If the vendor is the same person, linked in any way, related, business partners, or the hairdresser's dog. The transactions are linked in spite of any time period between them. Doing five sets of legals for five properties won't get round this. And then B, the nuance here that six or more properties can still opt for the non-residential rate of SDLT is correct. However, pretending this doesn't make much difference is wrong. Here are two examples to illustrate what I'm saying. Two that look very similar to two that I've done in real life. A portfolio or a block of flats, this will still work until June when this rule kicks in, when MDR is abolished, unit cost of under £40,000 per unit. Minimum rate of MDR applied, which is 1%. 550k purchase, 17 units, that's around about 32500 per unit. This was a block of flats in this example. Stamp duty land tax, 1%, because 3% wasn't payable, because we were below the 40k, and so it defaulted to 1%. After June, the 3% up to 250 and 8% beyond 250 on that transaction would be what would happen. Now, in reality, we would use the commercial rate instead there, but it would still be £17,000 rather than 5500 which is the stamp duty that we paid. The new resi would be 31500 for comparison. Every extra pound in purchase price beyond the 250k threshold yields 4% more stamp duty than it did before in this sort of scenario. Number two is a portfolio. Again, it could be flats as long as they are properly self-contained with a unit cost above 40k per unit, but under 250k per unit. So the 3% now applies to the transaction as the multiple dwellings relief minimum on the whole transaction because you're talking about the additional dwelling supplement. 10 properties, same vendor, average pricing £65,000 per unit. We paid 3% on 650k, 
i.e. 19,500 on this one by using MDR. Instead, under the new resi, it would be 39,500. Now, of course, again, we use the commercial, we would use the commercial rate here instead of MDR now. That would be 22,000, so not overly painful compared to the 19,500. But as the numbers get bigger, the differences soon get very large. Every extra pound in purchase price yields 2% more stamp duty than before in this scenario. Just go and ask a property trader how this will work in the real world. Exiting landlords just get kicked harder because of the price of entry for the trader just went up. Bit of a blow to those wanting to sell, it's fair to say. I'm not sure the Treasury understands this at all, because the long game here is hoping that portfolio landlords dispose to institutions and an extra 1% out of the whole transaction. The important concept to grasp is that of the marginal percentage difference, 2-4% to 4 rise in stamp duty for portfolio purchases, which has to come from somewhere. The limited company disposal becomes ever more attractive in relative terms, and thus the incorporate and sell shares route becomes more attractive. Although it's fair to say that isn't a fast option, that would be an understatement. So if anyone is selling with any element of time pressure, that's off the table, and the Treasury has taken 2%, most likely unless the landlord is disposing of a portfolio of particularly cheap flats, in which case they've taken 4%, out of that transaction. Even if that's split 1% each between the buyer and the seller, and as I said above, <laughs> ask how a trader works in the real world. The difference is already at the margin for purchases where, with rates where they are currently on the debt. I don't get it. I've seen sparing examples of the abuse of multiple dwellings relief over the years. Incredibly rare, but a ridiculous example. Selling a flat in Mayfair, same vendor also has a buy-to-let in Timbuktu, which can sell for 30 grand. And so the Mayfair purchase comes tumbling down the stamp duty bands by applying multiple dwellings relief. But you could easily get around things like that by, you know, making MDR for six or more trans six or more properties, just like the commercial rate is applied for six or more properties. Um, that hasn't been what they've done, and I don't think it's very smart, but there we go. But the government have also stated MDR doesn't raise any extra revenue. Well, I don't know how they would know that. Um, it sounds a bit ridiculous to me, but there's no point in arguing, because for the moment, it's done. And I'm sure it's a mistake that we picked up somewhere down the line when someone finally gets their head around it at the Treasury. So the second one, the removal of the furnished holiday lettings tax regime. An easy one for the government, and a real potential win-win from their perspective, more tax, fewer incentives to go to service accommodation to get around Section 24, more homes back in the PRS as a result, more new hotels too, more council tax, more business rates, more money, more planning fees. Bit of a blow to SA, unless you're already using limited companies, of course. Or is it? Well, the reality is, that's one more disincentive or barrier to entry of sorts. A reason not to do SA. If newer units are harder to come by, you're potentially advantaged by already operating within the sector, of course, if the sector is growing in demand. So with planning changes promised, coming, surely soon, probably getting shelved, to be honest, even as the renters' reform bill is under pressure not to happen from the backbench rebels, and the RRB is definitely the property policy piece of priority. And there's still leasehold reform to consider, remember. Surely changes to short-term rentals are less important than those two, and also politically much more likely to have some impact. And then the third one, oh Jeremy, CGT down from 28% to 24%. A little piece of evidence the ruling party is still on the side of the landlord. Yeah, I just put that one in to see if you were listening, that is a joke. Here's the exact wording from the government website. Reducing capital gains on residential properties to raise revenue and boost the availability of housing by encouraging residential disposals. I think we need a reality check here. This is just so tone deaf as to the current flavour of the residential property market. The, discriminat the discriminatory rate for property above the disposal of shares was a sneaky way of punishing long-term holders of property anyway, but encouraging disposals when there's a shortage of rental stock in the country as there already is. Encourage the exit door. I don't think even 10 seconds of thought has been given to the plight of the tenant here. That breach of the psychological barrier of 25% will encourage some disposals, I'm sure, in an environment where landlords really don't need much excuse to sell. The narrative also fits in. Lower tax, higher tax take. The traditional conservative mantra, which certainly can yield fruit, but the complete opposite of what they've been doing for years with corporation tax, for example. Hmm, 
A bit of a strange throwback to the old days is all I can say here. This one does kill some of the pain of the removal of multiple dwellings relief, as I've pointed out. Let's face it. So perhaps that does work in a way that makes some sense when put together. If you look at the changes over recent years, the near removal of the CGT allowances, so people don't wait and sell one every year because there's very little point anymore, and then the removal of MDR, but also the, the lowering of that punitive CGT rate of 28%, all leads towards portfolio landlords being able to dispose in one go. Government policy since 2015, let's face it. So, look, it's small beer to the Treasury, all of that, realistically. We're talking less than a billion pounds a year from all of those changes when combining the first two. And there's no real figures on how three will operate or play out. But that's a low hundreds of millions conversation, in my opinion, perhaps even less than 100 million. It's also a one off shot in the arm rather than an annual one, in my view. Perhaps a net minor positive to the Treasury without too many negative impacts. If anything, less stock helps landlords who remain in the game. No disaster and nothing to get too twisted about. I'm going to crack on now with the OBR because remember the fiscal rules state that the Chancellor needs to start here before building his budget. A quick, haha, line by line of the executive summary is in order because we need to see what the forecasts are saying. No mention of just how miserably ridiculous they've been in the past 18 months of forecasting, but then only the really successful look back at their losses and analyse them, let's face it. The rest just sweep it under the carpet. Here we go. So their overview. Starting with the UK economy has emerged from the twin global shocks of the pandemic and Russian invasion of Ukraine into a period of declining inflation but stagnating output. Stagflation, as I first said, in the supplement some time back now. Inflation has receded more quickly than we expected in November and markets now expect a sharper decline in interest rates. They got it consistently wrong. First it was transitory, then it was going to be this terrible recession causing beast. The pendulum has swung too far. This strengthens near-term growth prospects and should enable a faster recovery in living standards from last financial year's record decline. I'm not sure which metric they're using here, but as discussed before, the top was Q3 21 in real household disposable income, and the bottom was after Q3 22. 23 was improving, but from a bottom, so I'm, I'm not sure how they've measured this. But the medium-term economic outlook remains challenging. One of the biggest changes to our economy is an increase in the size and growth of the UK population. Well, that makes sense. The net migration figures caught everyone apart from Migration Watch on the hop. But higher and rising levels of inactivity offset its impact on the overall size of the workforce, leaving our forecast for the level of GDP in five years virtually unchanged from the autumn. And the level of GDP per person slightly lower. I've talked about this a few times recently. Lower participation, but also fewer hours being worked still needs reversing. The overall outlook for the public finances is also similar to November. Lower inflation and interest rates reduce the government's projected debt servicing and welfare costs, but they also reduce revenues. Because with frozen tax thresholds, inflation means more tax take, of course. The current forecasts now look a bit low, though, to me, as if we might follow a, if we follow a similar path to the US, US economy, and with services inflation still as high as it is, there's no guarantee their forecast is now correct. These pre-measures forecast changes result in a 20 billion fiscal improvement over the next two years, but leave borrowing largely unchanged in five years' time. The budget announces a package of net tax cuts, including a further 2p cut to the main rates of employee and self-employed national insurance contributions, the cost of which is partially recouped by tax rises in later years. This has been quoted elsewhere as giving £1 now to return £1.90 by 2027, so Pretty good business by the government. Borrowing is still projected to fall in each of the next five years thanks to tax as a share of GDP rising to a post-war high. Debt interest costs falling and per person spending on public services being held flat in real terms. Of course all of that would be predicated on the next five years being relatively uneventful and there being no major crises to sort out. Good luck with that one. It's unpopular, but it's also factual. In times of inflation above target, keeping tax high is a good idea, as it combats inflation. Debt interest costs falling, though, I'm not too sure about this. Remember, I'm in the camp of thinking interest rate cuts will be slower than most are expecting, and so the actual costs of borrowing will be rising for some time yet, for the same reason. The overall mortgage rate that people are paying is climbing at the moment. 
bonds that were issued since 2009 that have recently matured are all being rolled over at higher rates, not lower. This is just enough to meet the government's fiscal rules on our central forecast, with underlying debt falling as a share of GDP in 2028-29 by a historically modest margin of $8.9 billion. It's tight. Jeremy Hunt's used all the ammo we would allow him, is what that sentence basically says. The margin is a small fraction of the risks around that central forecast. Inflation could rebound and remain higher for longer if the conflict in the Middle East were to widen or domestic wage pressures do not subside as quickly as we assume. The latter of those two looks quite likely to me. There is also uncertainty around several key drivers of medium-term economic growth, including net migration, labour market participation and productivity growth. The fiscal forecast is highly sensitive to movements in interest rates, which have been unusually volatile recently, and that they've predicted particularly badly, thanks to their inflation forecasts being particularly bad. Since November, market expectations for a medium-term bank rate have been both 1% one percentage point higher, but also half a percentage point lower than has been assumed in this forecast. The fiscal forecast is also conditioned on the tax stake rising to near record highs, including through planned rises in fuel duty that have not, in practice, been implemented since 2011. It also assumes the government will stick to assumptions which imply no real growth in public spending per person over the next five years, despite committing to increasing spending on some major public services in line with or faster than GDP. This is the poison pill piece of Jeremy Hunt's portfolio of work. Very difficult to achieve. So the economic outlook. CPI inflation was 4.2% in the final quarter of last year, 0.6 percentage points lower than we forecast in November. Now, before you burst out laughing, when you realise that November is halfway through Q4, um, remember there were a couple of significant drops at the back end of last year that caught all of us on the hop a little bit. Um, so that is understandable. We now expect it to fall further to an average of 2.2% this year and 1.5% in 2025 before gradually returning to target at the end of the forecast period. So we're two months in, one month of figures in, that was 4% the print. Last month, I'd suspect a small fall for February, but I don't agree with our average this year getting down to 2.2%. I'd think the average inflation rate for 2024 will start with a 3. That affects later forecasts too, of course. I think we trend down to April, then bounce back again from a 2.x% print in April for CPI. Our lower central forecast for inflation is partly driven by larger anticipated falls in global energy prices. Well, look, most of these have already happened, but it's unclear how much they are pricing in. We also expect domestically generated inflation to be weaker as falling energy prices pass through into lower economy-wide costs and the labour market continues to loosen. I think the particularly the second point is relevant, but really, as above, a lot comes down to consumption, which has started to weaken. Our central forecast assumes disruptions in the Red Sea make only a small 0.2 percentage points upward contribution to inflation. But we also consider the risks of a widening conflict in the Middle East, through a scenario in which the sharp rise in energy prices causes inflation to spike back up to an annual peak of almost 6%. And that all seems pretty fair in terms of stress testing scenarios. Alongside easing inflationary pressures, market participants now expect a sharper fall in interest rates than in the autumn. Bank rate is expected to fall more steeply this year from its current peak of 5.25% to 4.2% in the final quarter of 2024. Look, my forecasts are above this, and I think rates at the end of this year look more like 4.5 or even 4.75. This is based on my stronger inflation argument and the fact that we should have been at 5.5 rather than 5.25 anyway from last September's meeting. In the medium term, bank rate falls further to 3.3%, almost three quarters of a percentage point lower than in our November forecast. With gilt yields also around half a percentage point lower across maturities, the cost of debt interest for the government is significantly lower than expected in November. But expectations remain volatile, as shown by our expectations for bank rate in 2028, oscillating between 2.7 and 4.2% since our November forecast. I'd be on the lower end in 2028 from here, but it's very speculative going out this far at this point. The medium term 3.25% or so doesn't look too ambitious, but it feels like the lower end of a forecast to me. Depends what you mean by the medium term, of course. So there's been important news since November about the size and projected growth of the UK population. 
Based on updated outturn data and January ONS population predictions, we now expect the total UK population to rise from 55 million, that's adults, in 2023 to 57 million by the end of the forecast, which is in five years' time. That's one and three quarter percent larger, or one million more people, than their November forecast. Hell of a find, isn't it? A million people in, uh, in a few months, but there we go. About two thirds of this increase is due to a higher estimate of the current UK population, which takes account of the 2021 census and net migration since then, with the remainder largely from higher net migration over the forecast. All this looks likely. Whilst more stay out of the workforce with COVID after effects, which are numerous, net migration stays strong in my view. Having reached a record high of 745,000 in 2022, net migration stood at 670,000 in the year to mid-2023, around 70,000 higher than assumed in our November forecast. Supported by the policy measures announced since our last forecast, our central forecast assumes annual net migration falls back to 315,000 in the medium term, up from 245,000 in our November forecast. I think they've under the other drivers of climate change and geopolitical uncertainty here. I also don't imagine a Labour administration being hostile on migration, and overt hostility has still led to the largest numbers we have ever seen by some way. The reality is we have a skills gap, we need to get people in to do those jobs, employers are willing to do that, and that's what the future of the country is basically built upon. We also explore scenarios in which annual net migration is around 200,000 higher or lower, which could raise or lower the level of GDP in 2028-29 by around 1.5%, but would have a small impact of uncertain direction on GDP per person. Now, I'm not sure why they see it as uncertain, because we've just seen a massive amount of net migration without GDP falling, but ultimately we've seen GDP per capita going down. Because ultimately, in the first year when you're an immigrant, you're not going to earn your top money. You're coming in relatively lower paid jobs as a general rule. We'd love to think we were hiring high skilled, high wage workers from abroad, but that's a, a, a minority of, of what we get in realistically. So as I say, I've said this before, GDP per capita is greater than GDP in terms of a yardstick, but it's still not a patch on the real household disposable income, which I still can't stand being relegated from the data stack here. The latest data also suggests that the post-pandemic rise in economic activity is likely to prove more persistent than we previously thought. The number of inactive working age adults is no longer declining from its post-pandemic peak, as previous data suggested, and instead has rebounded to 9.3 million. This keeps it at around its highest level in over a decade, and 700,000 more than before the pandemic. Around one third of the working age inactive population cite long-term illness as their principal reason for not being in the labour force. We estimate that the policies on childcare expansion, welfare reform and personal tax cuts announced in the past three fiscal events will increase total labour supply by over 300,000 people in full-time equivalent terms. But the ongoing fiscal drag from frozen personal tax thresholds will also weigh on work incentives, offsetting over a third of this rise for an overall change of close to 200,000. But after taking account of all the factors discussed above, we now expect the labour participation rate to continue falling from its pre-pandemic quarterly peak, of 64.3% to 62.8% by 2028, half a percent below our November forecast. Now this is different from the ONS measurement because it considers citizens over 16 rather than those in the 16 to 65 bracket that the ONS measure when they're talking about the labour force. This is a significant assumption that the trend will go on, not congruent with what we've seen in other countries. Austerity under most guises will turn the screw on this one way or another, but will that be Labour's goal or even an unintended consequence? So with a larger population but lower Labour participation, our forecast for potential output growth over the next five years is largely unchanged from November at around one and two thirds percent a year. Higher net migration, lower interest rates and lower energy prices boost population growth, business investment and productivity respectively. But the latest data on Labour participation, demographic and other factors have led us to revise down the overall trend participation rate and average hours worked. The net effect of these changes leaves the level of output 0.1% lower than in 2028 than our forecast in November, but 0.1% higher after accounting for the policies in this budget that boost labour supply. Let's see on these trends, shall we? Because you know what they say, the trend is your friend, but not at the end. The profile of output is slightly weaker in the near term, but slightly stronger in the latter part of the decade. GDP grew by only 0.1% in 2023, 
undershooting our November forecast by 0.4 percentage points. But we expect output growth to pick up to 0.8% in 2024, as interest rates fall and real household incomes recover. GDP growth picks up to around 2% in the middle of the decade, as slack in the economy is taken up, before falling back towards its assumed trend rate of around 1 and 2 thirds percent by 2028. These forecasts often work like this. If there's less in the short term, then there's more in the medium term. I'm not convinced that history actually bears this out, but since they only look and forecast forwards and never look backwards about what they've done wrong, or openly talk about what a poor quality job they've done in recent years, what do you expect? Policies announced in this spring budget provide a small temporary boost to demand in the near term and to supply in the medium term, which raises the level of real GDP by 0.2% in 2028-29. Risks to our medium term real GDP forecast remain elevated. The outlook for productivity growth is our most important and uncertain forecast judgment, and there is significant uncertainty over both our migration and participation forecasts. And I've said this before, Hunt has done a brilliant job within the framework he's been given. He's been dealt a terrible hand, and also the overall framework, forecasts and assumptions have been wrong, and sometimes miles out, so the result is never going to be optimal, is it? Having steadily declined since early 2022, real GDP per person is forecast to trough at one and a quarter percent below its pre-pandemic peak in the first half of 2024. Still the wrong measure, RHDI. Half the time I wonder if the OBR comes up with its own measurements rather than use ONS1 simply to justify their existence. That's my tinfoil hat comment of the week there. Persistent weakness in per person output has been driven by rises in inactivity and subdued productivity growth which has remained well below its pre-financial crisis average in recent years, even after accounting for the rebound from the pandemic. We expect real GDP per person to begin to recover later this year and regain its pre-pandemic level in 2025. Real GDP per person increases to around 4.5% above its pre-pandemic peak by the forecast horizon, but remains around three quarters of a percent lower than we forecast in November. Productivity growth in a year where minimum wage costs go up 11.5%, but inflation also goes back to 2.2% average as well, apparently. It just can't happen, in my opinion, or at least not without a prolonged recession, which isn't in the forecast. The recovery in output is largely driven by a pickup in household consumption growth to around 2% from 2025 to 2028. Now, we'd be unlikely to have a recession in those circumstances. That growth is stronger than in November due to higher household disposable incomes. Finally, they seem to have noted this. A sharper slowdown in inflation and lower interest rates. In contrast, business investment is expected to contract by around 5% this year, as past increases in interest rates raise the cost of capital and weigh on capital spending. It's a shame if that does happen, higher than other forecasted figures, that is. I don't have enough data to have a really good view here, to be honest. Investment then strengthens as interest rates fall and demand picks up. Recent trade data have been volatile and subject to large revisions. Nevertheless, we forecast that trade volumes will continue to be subdued in the next few years due to sluggish growth in the UK and global economies and the evolving impact of Brexit. I'm not sure that will be the case globally or much to do with Brexit at this point, to be honest. Anyway, from 2024 to 2028, we expect export and import volumes to average growth of 0.3% and 0.1% per year, respectively. As a result, net trade makes a negligible contribution to growth over the forecast period. It's a small point anyway in the scheme of things. Weak near-term GDP growth drives a modest rise in the unemployment rate in 2024, which then falls back as the recovery gathers pace. The latest ONS data suggests that unemployment fell to 3.8% in the fourth quarter of 2023. In contrast, claimant count data, measuring the number of people on unemployment benefits, has remained flat in recent months, while the redundancy rate has been on a slow upwards trend since the middle of 2022. We therefore judge that this and wider evidence is consistent with a moderate rise in the unemployment rate, peaking at 4.5% in the last quarter of 2024, in line with our forecast for subdued economic growth and increasing spare capacity in the economy. The peak in unemployment of around 1.6 million people is marginally lower, by about 40,000 people, than in our November forecast, though it comes half a year sooner. This is a much more realistic unemployment forecast than any of the recent ones. The unemployment rate is then forecast to decline to its estimated structural level of 4.1% by 2028. It's great for the economy if it stays around there. From a 30-year high of close to 7%, we expect nominal average pay growth to halve in 2024 as inflation falls and the labour market loosens. 
This is way too hopeful in my view. 9.8% minimum wage, 8.5% pension, 6.7% benefits. Whilst backwards looking, are much more likely to set the scene. I think more like 45 to 5% still by the end of 2024, down from 6.2% in December 23. That's 25% down, not halved. Again, a longer inflation half-life than they have predicted. Nominal earnings growth is slightly weaker than our November forecast as inflation is less persistent. In terms of total labour income, the weaker nominal earnings growth is partly offset by faster growth in the number of employees. That leaves the level of nominal wages and salaries, a key determinant of our fiscal forecast, 0.3% lower at the forecast horizon than in November. This is broadly in line with our revision to nominal GDP. Living standards are expected to recover more quickly than we forecast in November and grow by around 1% a year on average over the forecast. 22-23 remains the fiscal year with the largest year-on-year -year drop in living standards since ONS records began in the 1950s. And you can put that down to the energy crisis, quite frankly. But we now forecast real household disposable income per person to recover its pre-pandemic peak by 2025-26, two years earlier than in our November forecast. I just didn't understand this. Our HDI at the ONS has already recovered to those levels and is past them. I'm sure there's a technical difference somewhere, and indeed it's in the fact that they're measuring it per person, but I wish they'd taken the time to explain this. The faster recovery in living standards arises because the negative terms of trade shock brought about by the rise of the price of imported energy has unwound more quickly and fully than expected. Policies in this budget provide an additional boost to household incomes, with a further reduction in the main rates of national insurance contributions alone, providing a direct boost of half a percent. We've got a good runway over the next six months in energy prices, as long as we aren't knocked off our perch by geopolitical escalation, most likely in the Middle East. Nominal GDP is forecast to grow by an average of 3.3% a year over the forecast period, slightly less than expected in November due to the lower inflation outlook. The slower growth in the GDP deflator, combined with the little changed path for real GDP, leaves the level of nominal GDP 0.3% lower in the medium term than in our last forecast. Nominal GDP has done a lot better than this to keep pace or near pace with inflation. This sudden slowdown is of course linked to inflation and it will be no surprise that my position, more inflation than in the OBR forecast, is therefore linked to higher nominal GDP growth than more than this forecast indicates. In terms of the other key nominal tax bases, both profit and nominal consumption growth are weaker in the near term but rise faster in the medium term. By the forecast horizon, the change in both tax bases is broadly in line with that of nominal GDP, which makes sense. I'm stopping the line by line here because that's the end of their overview and all of their economic outlook. It's only about halfway through and the rest is much more macro and much less relevant to readers and listeners. I'm just going to select a couple of relevant points from now on and comment on them. So the budget measures with the largest estimated direct fiscal impact are a further reduction in rates of national insurance contribution, including a 2p cut in the main rate for employees and self-employed NICs from April 2024, which should cost 10.7 billion by 2028-29. And which is inflationary, realistically, we should note, because putting pounds in pockets of lower paid workers will tend to boost consumption, although arguably consumption could do with a bit of a boost at this time because inflation is coming from elsewhere, but the balance is very difficult to determine. Reform of the current non-domicile regime from April 2025, which raises 3.1 billion on average from 26.27 to 28.29. Now the OBR remain apolitical, but Hunt's deeming this policy from Labour and doing it in a conservative way is typical. I was disappointed that the VAT on goods for those visiting wasn't addressed, as it seems to be costing the UK both tax and revenue from overseas visitors, which is a bit silly. A number of new taxes and other revenue raising measures, including the introduction of vaping, vaping duty and the carbon border adjustment mechanism, HMRC anti-avoidance and compliance measures, and a one-year extension to the energy profits levy, which collectively raised 3.9 billion by 2028 to 29. Let's face it, vaping should have been taxed years ago. I'm always stunned about how slow governments are on the uptake in these situations. Tobacco duty will need replacement, and getting it from vapes is the logical next step. And 0.9 billion more departmental capital spending per year on average between 25-26 and 27-28 on the Public Sector Productivity Programme, focused on the NHS, 
and 0.8 billion per year less departmental resource spending from 2025-26 onwards. There's a small net benefit there, but the one shred of hope here, because this is only old policies rehashed one more time, is that artificial intelligence can make a difference. The larger the organisation, generally, the older and creakier the infrastructure, particularly in the public sector. So the savings will be there to be made, but will they be found and implemented in the time frame with the appropriate vigour? I'm sure the consulting firms will be rubbing their hands at this bit, though. Performance against the government's fiscal targets. The government's primary fiscal target is for public sector net debt, excluding the Bank of England, to fall in the fifth and final year of the forecast. In our central forecast, this rule is met by a margin of £8.9 billion. That's 0.3% of GDP down from the £13 billion, 0.4% of GDP margin, in our November forecast. As the pre-measures forecast is broadly unchanged by 28-29, the reduction in headroom is mostly due to the impact of policy measures. Mm. Suspiciously like the way the Bank of England works, isn't it? No, the debt isn't out of control because it's being paid back by the end of our forecast in five years' time. And what I mean is the debt pile is going down at that point in theory, rather than going upwards. I don't mean all the debt is paid back, to be clear. Who holds us to account if the forecast is wrong? No one. The bank uses three years. Why do the OBR get five? It's arbitrary. No one asks these questions. Five years is the length of term of a parliament. Although, apparently, only when the incumbents are hanging on by their fingernails, now the Fixed Term Act has been repealed. You could argue the other way quite vociferously as well. Five years isn't long enough to sort out the pandemic impact, nor is it long enough to consider to measure long-term effects of infrastructure projects, which we should at least consider borrowing to fund because they will have positive net present value and positive societal value, help with levelling up and increase the tax take over time. This is more the Andy Haldane viewpoint, and I'm inclined to agree with this side because I'm much more of a long-term thinker than I am a short-term one. One more, and this is the last one from the OBR report, I promise. Risks and uncertainties. Historically large changes in energy prices, interest rates, wage growth and population growth have driven significant revisions to our recent economic and fiscal forecasts. We continue to emphasise the uncertainties around our forecasts and the possibility that any of our key judgments could prove too optimistic or pessimistic. Key risks for this forecast include, while our central forecast is for inflation to return to target this year, the outlook remains highly uncertain. I'm certain this shouldn't be the central forecast, as I've discussed. Externally, conflict in the Middle East poses risks to global goods and energy markets. A widening of the current conflict in the Middle East could significantly reduce energy supply from the region and further disrupt global supply chains for goods. In this scenario, quarterly inflation spikes back up to over 7%. This is the scenario that would see interest rates move upwards, as I have highlighted as a material risk in recent months. Base would have to go upwards in this scenario. There are no two ways about it. I dislike the fact that they don't try to put a probability on this. I have it at 10 to 15%. Not likely, but uncomfortably possible. We estimate that this could raise borrowing by 23.1 billion on average over the five-year forecast and leave underlying debt 0.8% higher as a share of GDP by 28-29. Domestically, our central projection is for wage growth to slow over the coming year, but wages may prove stickier and keep inflation higher for longer. This is the thing. They primarily care about this because of the tax take, and that's their job. But the implications would be much, much wider than this. I'm sure you can see that. Our forecast is based on market expectations for bank rate and gilt yields. And whilst these have fallen significantly as inflation has dropped, they remain unusually volatile. They have, but that volatility has really reined its way in in the past couple of months. Since we closed our November forecast, expectations for medium-term bank rate have moved between 2.7 and 4.2%, and 10-year gilt spot yields have oscillated between 3.5 and 4.7%. If effective interest rates on all central government debt were just 0.3 percentage points higher or lower, this would eliminate the headroom to debt falling in 28-29, or increase it by around 9 billion respectively. <coughs> That's no small change. You can see why Hunt has left 9 billion headroom. It covers the worst case scenario to break even as far as the OBR see it. In other words, he has used every single penny that he possibly can for some small election bribes that's also have theoretical benefit in the medium term to the economy. You've got to admit that's clever within the rules of the game. A major change in our forecast since November has been incorporating updated net migration projections and labour force survey data from the ONS. Future migration levels are highly uncertain and difficult to forecast, 
particularly given policy changes announced since November. Our scenarios show that if annual net migration was around 200,000 higher or lower than the ONS projection of 315k in the medium term, it might raise or lower GDP by around 1.5% in 28-29 respectively. I'm a light observer of the migration numbers. If asked to throw a figure out there based on the recent changes, I'd have said 400 to 450k was more likely. But the most recent changes to frankly putting people off, including rules about bringing partners, children, etc., might well get that down to something starting with a three. But it feels to me more like we're in a world where disruption from multiple sources makes the UK more and more attractive as a destination, as much as we all might moan about it. But the impact on GDP per person is much smaller and its direction unclear. In our higher migration scenario, borrowing is 19.9 billion lower by the forecast horizon and underlying debt 3.1% lower as a share of GDP. Our downside scenario is symmetric with borrowing up 19.9 million and underlying debt up by 3.1% of GDP. As I've said, I've limited regard for GDP per person. I do like the fact they've used RHDI per person in some of the rest of the report, although again, I wish there were further explanations. If RHDI is up, and it is, and RHDI per person is down, just as GDP per capita is down, then households have simply got bigger in terms of number of people per household. It's not just number of households increasing. So that's against cultural trends that have been going on for 50 plus years and more being driven by necessity. I wrote a piece some months back asking where are all the people essentially because the level of migration simply couldn't have been absorbed by the rental sector in the way one would expect. Growing households, living with friends, family, etc. And of course, the tendency to do that more and more since cost of living crisis and move back in with mum and dad has been the only way for this to happen. So this does make some sense, but I don't see it as a long term trend. I think it will reverse as cost of living eases away and real hard household disposable income per person goes back upwards. In our November 2023 economic and fiscal outlook, we estimated that half a percent higher or lower annual productivity growth would reduce or raise borrowing by more than 40 billion by 2028-29. Productivity growth across the forecast is little changed by, from November, but the starting level is half a percent lower as revised population shows a larger population producing a similar amount of output. The forecast looks hopeful compared to recent productivity growth, but there is a real need to cut costs. There is AI making some impact, and the false figures of the pre-crisis era get further away each day as well, of course. In simple terms, though, this has to work in concert with the unemployment numbers going up or the employed numbers going down, as I prefer to look at the figures. The level of economic activity remains significantly higher than before the pandemic. Our 2023 July Fiscal Risks and Sustainability Report considered upside and downside scenarios for future inactivity levels. The downside scenario assumed the working age participation rate fell 1.2 percentage points by 27-28, leading to a 1.5% fall in GDP, 21.3 billion higher borrowing and a 3.4 percentage point rise in debt as a share of GDP. The upside scenario is broadly symmetric, but with slightly smaller decreases in borrowing and debt. I think this is unlikely. Solve the industrial disputes in the NHS and numbers on waiting lists will come down, not go up. Surely the next administration should do that effectively, as it seems that the doctors are now holding on in the hope of the Labour government to get what they feel will be a fair pay settlement. Rachel Reeves will have to be the pantomime villain there, because the 35% won't be happening based on her austere rhetoric. The whole report is tens of thousands of words in total. In fact, it may easily be over 100,000 words. Some of this, I'm sure, is absolutely necessary. Some is justification that the OBR is worthwhile, as there seem to be growing reform, growing rumblings that reform is needed. Some is just so that it is too long to analyse in detail and argue with, I think. Nonetheless, the weak performance of some of the forecasts in recent years and the sweeping of these forecasts under the carpet or explaining them away conveniently is never lost on me. I like the concept of the rules, go outside of the rules and you open a trust quarting situation and a beating from the international bond markets. But whether they're the right rules or not, run by the right people, that's much tougher to establish. Anyway, I know we're a long way in this week, but there are two more things I wanted to share with you in this budget summary. That is to take two opposing interpretations of it and share the highlights with you. The two summaries of interest are from the Resolution Foundation, who I would describe as centre-left leaning, 
with the mission of looking after the lower paid, focusing on workers, as Jeremy Hunt keeps saying that he is, and also the Institute for Fiscal Studies, more on the centre-right, both well-respected compared to some of the think tanks that are less transparent about their funding. There's a good web link in the text, which is opendemocracy.net, who funds you, which you might want to take a look at. So I'm going to start on the left after tossing a metaphorical coin. Sweet and sour was their preferred analysis at the Resolution Foundation. Sweet in terms of money now for the lower paid, sour in terms of future austerity in the next parliament. The message is that workers have been prioritised over pensioners because of the 2% national insurance cut. Eight billion given now, that's to personal net taxes basically. 38 billion split into tax rises, mostly through frozen thresholds and public sector real terms cuts. 19 billion to each over the next parliament on the Resolution Foundation numbers and the OBR numbers for that matter. They then do make that an apples for apples comparison instead by pointing out that these measures add up to 65 billion of tax cuts over the next parliament. 19 billion rise, 65 billion cuts. Well, where does the rest come from? Borrowing, of course, that is just about sustainable within the fiscal rules framework already discussed. Those employed on a 50k salary, about 40% above the median wage, are best off with a £1,200 net boost to the pocket. Those most susceptible to vote conservative, maybe, you might say. Those earning 19 k or less, so that now means less than full-time minimum wage, are worse off as they lose more from threshold freezes than they gain from cuts. They then consider the whole parliament. Middle earners on between 26000 and 60000 will see their personal tax bills fall, while lower and higher earning taxpayers will see their taxes rise. The 8 million taxpaying pensioners are facing an average of £1,000 a year higher tax bills. Tax relative to GDP will be up to the highest level since 1948 if all these policies are enacted. And of course they won't be either way. Cuts to departments that are looming look around 70% as aggressive as those pursued in 2011 to 15. The more meaningful cuts that were sustainable back then. But there is surely far less fat in these departments now than there was back then before the 2015 and onwards cuts, which were the ones much more maligned as swinging or similar. I'm just going to end this part with two of the quotes from Torsten Bell, who is the CEO of the Resolution Foundation. The biggest choice Jeremy Hunt made was to cut taxes for younger workers while allowing taxes to rise for 8 million pensioners. This is a staggering reversal of the approach taken by Conservative governments since 2010. It is undoubtedly good economics, even if the politics are a harder sell. And he also said... For all that, the big picture has not changed at all within this budget. Britain remains a country where taxes are heading up, not down, rising by the equivalent of £3,900 per household over this parliament, and where incomes are set to remain below their level at the last general election when voters return to the polls. So, on to the Institute for Fiscal Studies then. More likely to take a position on what this will actually mean in my experience. Paul Johnson's opening salvo of his analysis was quite powerful, and I've replicated that as well here. Nothing that Jeremy Hunt did yesterday, nor anything that the OBR said, changes anything very significantly. Which is a shame, because it means we are still heading for a parliament in which people will be, on average, worse off at the end than the start. Looking at a debt-to-GDP ratio that is the highest level in 70 years and is showing no signs of falling. Facing debt interest payments at close to all-time highs. Seeing worrying increases in the number of individuals moving on to health and disability related benefits, bringing huge challenges for those households and rising costs for the public births. Despite the genuinely significant cuts in national insurance contributions, stuck with a situation where tax revenues will have risen by a record amount as a share of national income over this parliament and still heading towards UK record levels. Implicitly planning on big cuts in public investment spending overall, and cuts to many areas of day-to-day -day spending on public services, despite very obvious signs of strain in many areas. All of that was true on Tuesday, and all of it remains true today. In all likelihood, it will still be true come the general election. It's tough to argue with all of that, to be honest. The fourth point, and that point is around seeing worrying increases in the number of individuals moving on to health and disability-related benefits, fairly quickly gets you labelled rabid right-winger, in some circles, without too much effort, but it has the uncomfortable position of being true as well. The one bonus he highlights is that the OBR now think we will, in terms of our HDI per capita, be ahead of the pre-pandemic period two years before the previous forecast. As you can tell from my analysis, I think it'll be quicker than that. 
The IFS, like many others, fails to distinguish between RHDI and RHDI per capita, which is concerning and leading to much analysis that is simply incorrect in a wider debating landscape. The next sentence I want to highlight makes me think even more that Rachel Reeves will frankly need to get someone to tell her how to justifiably change these fiscal rules. And perhaps that is Andy Haldane, the former Chief Economist of the Bank of England, who is already on this bus in a big way. Here it is. The next Parliament could well prove to be the most difficult of any in 80 years for a Chancellor wanting to bring the debt down. It's pretty powerful stuff, but behind that it also seems to imply that the debt's going to need to go up. And does Paul Johnson really believe that Rachel Reeves wants to bring the debt down rather than pursue Labour's more ideological policies? That seems to be the hint in that comment to me. The moral of the story from the IFS perspective is that to get anywhere near a country that raises more in tax than it spends, before we consider debt servicing costs, this £38 billion in spending cuts on investment and government departments would need to actually happen, and they, like me, are sceptical. It is noted that the last-minute tax cuts have been favoured above government spending increases on defence, which Hunt maintains is on its way to the 2.5% of GDP target. Now this is an interesting stat from the IFS. Well, well over 60% of pensioners now pay income tax. Income tax changes will leave most of them £650 a year worse off by 2027 and over £3,000 a year worse off if they're higher rate taxpayers. I note the 8.5% triple lock pension rise this year hasn't been called back to, however. Mr Johnson dismisses the rhetoric of working towards abolishing national insurance from Sunak and Hunt as a false dawn. Firstly, employers' national insurance would remain as many readers will no doubt know to their detriment, and anyone who runs a business properly looks at the total cost of the staff when considering compensation packages. Secondly, that £40 required would need to come from somewhere. Where? Nicking the non-DOM changes, and also the extension to the energy profits levy, that windfall tax, were both stolen from Labour and make Labour's job more difficult. All these things that the non-DOM tax changes were going to fund are now gone, and Labour will be running around sorting that out and picking up the pieces. That's the advantage of the incumbents. I also thought this next sentence was very fair and bared re-quoting. If I am sceptical about Mr Hunt's ability to stick to his current spending plans, I am at least that sceptical that Rachel Reeves will preside over deep cuts in public service spending. You and I both, Paul. You and I both. The end was as powerful as the beginning of Mr Johnson's summary, and it's easy to see why he's a very useful director for the IFS. This was not a budget which addressed the real challenges we are facing, because it was not transparent about what those challenges are. Government and opposition are joining in a conspiracy of silence in not acknowledging the scale of the choices and trade-offs that will face us after the election. They, and we, could be in for a rude awakening when those choices become unavoidable. For completeness, I will just sign off by saying that the IFS has been around for 55 years, and was formed, basically, because the feeling was that the government didn't know its backside from its elbow. That's improved, but transparency really hasn't, as Paul Johnson says above. The stated mission from 1969 is still as important today, clearly, to inform public debate on economics via establishment of rigorous independent research in order to promote the development of effective fiscal policy. And look, maybe the politicians have got to lie, although they lie all the time, of course, it's just accepted in the profession. Otherwise, they'll never win an election. They can only be ever selectively honest. But the reality we're facing as a nation is five relatively tough years from a fiscal and public sector perspective. If I'm right about house prices, those not owning property will also face an even tougher five years. If I'm right about inflation, then my 25% plus five-year capital growth forecast is a shoo-in. We'll find out soon, of course. So well done for getting to the end of this one. Don't forget the Property Business Workshop on the 24th of April, Wednesday. Tickets for you or anyone you know might want to come along. Links in the show notes, bit.ly forward slash PBWTWO. Onwards and upwards as we continue to spring through March. And just remember, keep calm and carry on.